how are you going to bring genetics and use it in our large clinical trials to push the frontiers forward? So I can start with bone, and uh, I can tell you that we are already sort of prematurely have the advent of some uh, companies providing gene chips and providing information for patients about their potential risk, generally those with uh, uh, osteoporosis, not with rarer diseases. So that makes the challenge difficult, and I think it outlines what you said. We really need to take what we now know about the disease and about our treatments, and then look at the gene by uh, uh, pharmacologic intervention and see if indeed we can identify those people who are at greatest risk, but also at greatest benefit from the treatment. And I think that's our biggest challenge, is not so much in terms of diagnosis, because as I showed, I think we're very good now at identifying those people at highest risk, but it's really tailoring therapy to individual patients based on their individual genomic information, as well as their nutritional and environmental uh, factors. Dr. Moxley? Uh, I'm not sure I can give quite as uh, precise an answer because of the array of different inherited uh, neuromuscular and muscle diseases uh, and the underlying pathomechanisms being different. Uh, let me just make a comment about myotonic dystrophy that you heard a little bit about this morning. Uh, by saying that we do have a definitive diagnostic test and that uh, new genetic information has allowed us to distinguish the form of myotonic dystrophy that I spoke about this morning from another form of myotonic dystrophy that I didn't speak about this morning, myotonic dystrophy type 2, which is a uh, nucleotide, tetranucleotide repeat disease. And interestingly, it has the same kind of pathomechanism that the trinucleotide disease has. That is to say, you have a sequestration holding hostage uh, these nuclear regulatory uh, proteins, and it ends up causing a somewhat similar clinical picture, but different. So that uh, to go to what Cliff was saying, uh, they're, they're within the spectrum of uh, retaining nuclear regulatory uh, factors, and they have the same kind of RNA clumps in muscle. There's a difference somehow genetically, and we'll have to clarify what those are. And then with some of the other uh, genetic disorders, and I, I don't want to uh, plabber on too much. There are others in the audience who certainly know a lot about Duchenne dystrophy or the congenital muscular dystrophies or the other uh, inherited muscle diseases you saw in the list. There are a number of, of really important breakthroughs that are being made uh, dealing with all of the different proteins that form uh, signaling and linking between the outside of the muscle membrane to the inside of the muscle membrane. And there are uh, real opportunities within, I, I hope, the next uh, five years to translate genetic information that would need to be discerned, in fact, probably from tissue samples, not necessarily from blood samples. I, I would throw it back to Dr. McGowan and ask her to invite you to talk a little bit about your opinions about it and also about epigenetic uh, regulatory factors. Uh, we, we sort of danced around a potential elephant in the room in that we, we always look at people in families and wonder a bit about, well, hmm, uh, why, why didn't he have as much symptoms as the other one? And they both had the same number of repeats. Jim? I don't... I would like to see more people coming to the microphone to take okay, advantage of this. Please. I don't know if I'm going away from your uh, original. Your original um, uh, question, but I, you, I was impressed by something you mentioned about the uh, uh, specific specificity to things. How you you're looking at the differences that you're able to see now more clearly as you as you understand more about the different many different disease, diseases, but I was thinking in terms of, just as an example, for open heart surgery, for instance, there we have an aortic valve uh, um, trial going on to, to determine the difference between valve sparing, let's say, and the composite graft, which is a Marfan syndrome problem. And one of the things that has been clarified from this is that each patient presents differently. And the tissue, even though it's Marfan tissue that everybody understands, still presents differently in each individual. And therefore, it's more of a partnership between now, at this time, 
between the patient decision of what they want and the doctor is able to, the surgeon is able to provide various uh, options that weren't even thought about before. <laughs> so that this differentiation, as you delve deeper into all of these amazing dis different, uh, disorders, is really becoming clarified and, and offering so many different options than they had before. So many different approaches, which is fantastic. Thank you. C could I make just one comment about the complexity of, of how we individualize uh, treatment? Because it comes back to what Cliff was talking about. I failed to mention tissue mosaicism, and I, I don't want to get off too much off the topic. But in myotonic dystrophy, those repeats you know that I showed, they're not the same in different target tissues. The repeat expansion in blood, let's say it might be 300. In muscle, it might be 7,000. So that in different target tissues, in brain and in the heart and in the Purkinje system of the heart, the repeat expansion is different. Now maybe that influences why the manifestations show up differently. Maybe there are clues that we could take back to other disorders to individualize our treatment, make it more specific based on what we see in tissue. Thank you. Um, what I'll call microphone one. The Wangji National Eye Institute. A congratulations for the exciting work to Dr. Moxley. Antisense uh, therapy remains a challenge. Obviously, it is targeted, but uh, up till now, is for the last 30 years, uh, it was uh, a tremendous challenge. So, are you going to use the phosphodiester versus the more stable derivatives of phosphorothioate? in the proposed therapy in the mouse model, maybe sometimes later in patients? Uh, very good question. Uh, you're asking someone who's not really a maven or morpholinos and all the different antisense. But uh, we have been partnering with uh, ISIS uh, to identify uh, sort of the free uh, uh, morpholino antisense that we've been using. And these are the same molecules that actually didn't do very well in previous trials. I don't know if that's what you were getting at over the past 30 years, but yes. you know, the liver had taken up a lot of these antisense molecules and other tissues like, sorry. And so how, how is it working in our patients? It turns out from uh, our uh, measurements of distribution volume and following the antisense molecules that they hone in on nuclei and that because of those big CUG repeats, they act like a big sink for the antisense. And they, they seem to really hold on for a long time because uh, in, in the latest group of mice, I don't want to go too far and say something that's subsequently not validated, but I, I think that what I'm about to say is unequivocally true. Uh, it's gone for at least three months on a single injection, and those mice uh, have had almost total no restoration of the normal architecture of the muscle, no myotonia. Uh, what what was your thinking? So are you going to administer it locally at the site where there is more damage or it will be systemic? Uh, no, uh, uh, our plan is to give it systemically. And we initially gave it, uh, I didn't present it because I just presented the injection into the muscle directly. But subsequently we've looked at intravenous injections uh, and the mice have shown a, a generalized systemic effect with a, with a caveat being it doesn't pass the blood-brain barrier. We may have to work with people like yourself and others who are knowledgeable about how to add a protein moiety or something that would make it permeable to the, to the brain. The same with whole in Duchenne dystrophy and uh, maybe Val Dr. Swick or others in the audience who are more familiar with the absolutely most current use of antisense in, in Duchenne dystrophy. But what we're really excited about, it, optimistic. Congratulations, good thank, luck. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Kosla. Um, so Kosla, uh, Mayo Clinic. Uh, so first of all, I wanted to congratulate Cliff on doing the impossible, which is in 15 minutes, you know, providing uh, kind of a state of the, uh, right, exactly. Uh, so, you know, I wanted to just kind of expand on that a little bit putting on my clinician's hat. So, you know, I've been at uh, Mayo Clinic for about 25 years, about when Mayo started, when uh, Anayam started. And just going to see patients back then in the, let's say, the osteoporosis clinic, you could offer them calcium and vitamin D and, you know, maybe estrogen, which we don't use anymore, and perhaps calcitonin. 
And you just see what's happened today in large part due to research supported by NIAMS and other NIH institutes, but also in partnership with industry. I mean, so we now have four different bisphosphonates. We have a selective estrogen receptor modulator uh, based on the very fundamental discoveries based on of rank ligand signaling. We have an antibody to rank ligand and uh, a teriparatide or Forteo based on some of the work that was done originally at Mass General on PTH. And then on the LRP uh, signaling path, wind signaling path, where we now have an antibody to sclerostin. So if you think about a complex disease and what the investment in research has spawned, it's really truly remarkable going from, you know, maybe one drug, which we don't use anymore, <laughs> to a plethora of drugs where it's become like hyperlipidemia or hypertension where we have a, a large number of choices. So uh, it really, I think, is a tribute to the investment in research that NIH has made. Thank you so much. Uh, Cliff? Yeah, Joan, I just want to amplify on something. You know, Francis said he didn't want to project 25 years, maybe five years, but I think if we look forward, we're going to, Sandeep, uh, elaborate on all the drugs. We're going to look back once we're 10 years out and say, gee, now we have tailored treatment. We just don't say you have osteoporosis, select a drug, and then if that doesn't work, we'll go to another drug, but we'll actually be able to tell which drug will work the best in a given individual, and that's, that's probably one of our biggest challenges. One thing I think as we congratulate ourselves and, and the Institute and the Congress and, and the American people for funding research, we shouldn't forget that 16,000 normal, healthy, older people who joined SOF and Mr. Oz and the people who join in the University of Rochester trials, people with serious, serious diseases and go to the clinic and volunteer, uh, Priscilla Ciccarello's own family who participate in the clinical trials, that's the way we know what we know is because those people have participated and helped us. Microphone. Uh, Shubrata Shaha, State University of New York, Downstate Medical Center. I would also sort of a, su support Dr. Kostler's that Dr. Rosen's talk on osteoporosis, you know, it was a very short time, you get a very good overview. I have a question though. Now that we have all these wonderful drugs that is helping very large number of patients, some of them are showing side effects, like the transverse fracture of the femur or osteonecrosis in a high dose. How can we really prevent that? Or do you have a crystal ball to see we have personalized medicine that we'll be able to predict those? No, I think that's, that's the million dollar question and having served on the FDA, we, we take up these issues all the time, very rare occurrences of common therapies. And I think, again, the answer comes back to understanding the basic pathophysiology of something like a subtrochanteric fracture. And we just don't know, but we need more work. And part of the initiatives at the NIH are to sponsor evaluations, cohort analysis, looking at records from these large randomized trials. For example, SOF. Dennis Black has gone back and looked in the SOF study at subtrochanteric fractures or in the FIT trial. And I think that's our real challenge. Um, until we understand why certain drugs have rare side effects, because they're so rare, they're so difficult to study, we're going to still struggle with this kind of issue. Could, could I ask uh, a sure. question or should, are there other? I'd just like to ask about uh, the possible interaction between muscle research and osteoporosis research. And the fact that as I look at a lot of my patients, and certainly Dr. Swick would see this and others in the audience who are caring for patients with muscle wasting diseases, a lot of times you se see severe osteopenia. It's not always due to anti-gravity loss. I look at Steve up there. Uh, I remember when he was organizing the, uh, you know, the NASA study with NIH where we were looking at weightlessness and trying to see what that had on bone metabolism. So I, I would be curious if you see some opportunities for us to partner to bring together some of the programs within NIAMS. So uh, um, I think that's starting to happen. Tom Clements is here. He's been looking at muscle-bone interactions. Uh, Linda Bonewald is here. She has been a pioneer in looking at the osteocyte and the interactions with bone. And I have the privilege, I guess it's a privilege, of being on study section regularly for an IAMPS and seeing the confluence of muscle and bone. 
and saying, wow, this is an interaction. And what's great is it's under one institute. And so I think there's going to be a lot more of that. We're only beginning to understand the signals. Do they communicate? How do they communicate? Is it more than just mechanical? One final comment about that. Uh, if you look at autopsy specimens, some of our patients have donated their uh, bodies for study. And if you look at the distribution of atrophy and wasting and myotonic muscular dystrophy, more often than not, it is very distal at the attachment of the myotendinous attachment to the bone. And then it tracks back, and you'll see actually resumption of almost normal-looking muscle. And so it, it has made me uh, very interested. And, I mean, there have been questions raised about myotendinous junction behavior and Duchenne dystrophy and differential regulation of myodomains at these regions. So that I, I'd be really... Uh, uh, curious about the opportunities going forward. Thank you. That's I, why we're in the same institute. I just we're, have we're to married. add. I have to add to this. I have to add in the sense that you know this science is wonderful, but I do know there are many people, uh, several people that I know from the years back that are with the voluntary health organizations out there in the in the group, and I do think that the uh, the uh, uh, promotion and the ex the extending of the information that you have here into the wide world through the organizations which gives it integrity and gives it uh, accuracy, which I think is so important, and that's what NIAMS has been, you know, built this partnership. So important. I love the passion, by the way. Before the break, Dr. Katz has a few words. So talking about passion, I have uh, chaired now close to 50 uh, council meetings. And uh, I remember lots of things that went on during those 50 council meetings. But one I remember the most, and that is that poignant moment in closed session when we were discussing some uh, applications about osteogenesis imperfecta. Uh, Jean Mandeville, the mother of, a, uh, of an affected uh, son, uh, was talking about them. And this must have been early in the course of your, of your time on the council. And this speaks to the support of rare diseases and how do you get people involved in research in these rare diseases. And uh, Priscilla said, well, that's all well and good to be able to see which one of these is the best to support. But I have to tell you, that in looking through the list of applications, there are none that have to do with Marfan syndrome. And there was a real quiet uh, in the room, and I think that that did change. I think it changed as a consequence of your activities and the activities of the disparate communities. You speak to Hal Dietz as he spoke at our, he's on our, uh, uh, one of our council members. Uh, he talked about how going to meetings, meeting people who he hadn't met before at workshops, uh, brought together that program project that you, uh, that you discussed, and now certainly there's an enormous amount of activity, two science papers in, uh, in uh, April in, uh, uh, on uh, Marfan syndrome. So, uh, so I think that's how one person and a community can really help things along. But the most poignant moment of the 50 or so uh, council meetings was your comment. There are no applications in Marfan syndrome. <laughs>